soit bien outillée pour passer à travers tout ce qui va leur arriver. <rire> Chaque fois que j'entre dans un espace où on n'attend pas une femme, où on n'attend pas quelqu'un comme moi, j'ouvre une porte pour toutes celles que je voudrais voir voilà, entrer dans cet espace-là. J'étais à Casablanca, une grande ville quand même de 3,5 millions et demi d'habitants, et j'ai décidé de me présenter aux élections législatives. Et je n'ai pas été élue, bien sûr, parce qu'il y avait zéro femme au Parlement. Mais après, je me suis présentée aux troisièmes élections, aux quatrièmes élections, aux cinquièmes élections, sixième. Et ce n'est au bout de la septième, en 1997, donc 21 ans après, que j'ai pu être élue municipale parmi 0,34% de femmes dans les conseils municipaux. Eh ben, il fallait être têtu, et je le suis. That sort of paternalism that I resent with other people, you know, I, I catch myself doing that. It bothers me that my reflex is to be sexist. عم حط اللوم على هالمجتمع الذكوري اللي بخليني على طول متذكرة إني أنا مرة. وما بخليني انسى اني انا مرة وبخلي الرجال على طول متذكر انه رجال وبحاجة يثبت لكل اللي حواليه انه رجال. I was a strong woman. I never imagined that I would be in a relationship with a man that would physically abuse me. It didn't take me long to realize that I would die in this relationship. If I didn't leave, I would die. Les femmes, c'est la mère de l'humanité. Et il est vrai.
vrai que lorsque euh, on ne s'engage pas pour la cause des femmes, c'est tout simplement une menace pour nous tous. One of the indigenous tribes in, in Latin America, the chief said to me, we think of our tribe as like an eagle. One wing is male, one wing is female. And only when the two wings are equal will our tribe fly true. That's my goal. I am your daughter, your wife and a mother. I am your sister, I am your lover. I am your daughter, your wife and a mother. Soy una mujer perseverante. Why get to mangea po? I am a powerful. Vai sou as chimica do mar. Dynamic, fierce. Hopefully. No more fight left in me. Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Anissa, the head of media programs at Spark News. It's so great to see people coming from different parts of the world, from Kenya, Spain, Japan. I think I also see the US, Morocco, South Africa, and the list continues. So this year, despite our differences, whether they are geographical or cultural, we've all been facing similar ordeals. Shut borders, economy at a standstill, restrictions of freedom and drastic changes in our day-to-day -day lives with school, shops and offices closed not to mention illness or mourning for some of us. And all of us have suffered the pandemic one way or another, but some have been disproportionately affected. And I'm talking about women. Gender equality has been pushed back decades, whether it be in terms of equal access to health, economic opportunities or public representation. The media coverage of the pandemic has to a large extent conveyed an image of women as victims whether as frontline workers, victims of abuses, or the first casualties of a crumbling economy. Of course, it is essential to make that, that assessment, but it is equally essential to go beyond, look for solutions, initiatives addressing the challenges women are facing to be treated as equals. It is equally essential to show that gender equality is not just about a question of basic human rights, but also about building more inclusive and resilient societies. Women are not only victims, they play a crucial part in addressing our most pressing issues. Women are not only victims, they are also agents of change. So at Spark News, we made a well bet, convincing leading news outlets around the world to join forces and participate in a constructive media operations on gender equality. And the great news is that 15 on some of the most most prestigious media have positively responded to our call, and thus despite their own difficulties and lack of resources due to the crisis. So tomorrow's world will be gender equal or it will not be. And we all have a collective duty, the one to not let the opportunity pass to change in a meaningful and long lasting way our society and push for a more inclusive and altogether better world. And some are already taking the steps to make this happen. Women, men, nations, institutions, companies, and NGOs across the globe are coming up with innovative and creative and impactful ways to addressing local gaps and gender-based global issues. At their level and through their initiative or new policies, they are pushing for not only women's rights, but society at large. And the Generation Equality Forum taking place in Paris from June 30th to July 2nd bringing together governments, corporations, and changemakers from around the world could lay the ground for the culture shift that is at stake. So through the media operation, starting today, you get the chance to discover some of the concrete actions that are already paving the way towards gender equality. And today, to make this live, this unique to our live event, you'll also get the opportunity to digitally, of course, meet experts, changemakers, leaders that are working on finding new solutions or amplifying what works. So I'm going to try and stop right there because we have 
beautiful lineup and want to give the floor to our incredible participants. There are so many of them today, but first it's my pleasure to welcome to the stage our host of the day, Bruno Vini. Bruno, you are the former president of the Women's Forum and founder of tribe to be and we couldn't ask for a better master of ceremony. Bruno, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Anissa. Uh, hello, everyone. And uh, thank you all for joining us for all around the globe. Um, we've been organizing a very nice program for the next two hours. So I'm very happy to uh, introduce uh, you to this program. Uh, if you are with us today, it's because you feel concerned by gender equality issues. Maybe you are already an activist uh, on the subject. Maybe you are not but uh, you'd like to understand how to do, how to change things. So to open this uh, live event, we are very honored to welcome Funzile Mambo Nunca, who is UN Under Secretary General and Executive Director of UN Women. Uh, please, uh, Funzile, the floor is yours. Thank you, nobody here. Thank you very much. Uh, no for this opportunity uh, to tell you about uh, generation equality and hopefully to answer any of the questions you may have about uh, generation uh, equality. Uh, generation equality was born out of recognition that the implementation of the Beijing platform was moving very slow and uneven. That the implementation of SDGs was moving slow as well as the implementation of the Security Council Resolution 1325 on women, peace and security was not moving very slow. For some reason, uh, gender equality in the global affairs manages to always get pushed back and not take the front line and uh, the strides that you expect uh, uh, from, from uh, gender equality. Uh, we then uh, decided that uh, we needed to accelerate the implementation of all these important documents because all of them uh, contain very groundbreaking uh, information about uh, women. Uh, Beijing platform, for instance, in Beijing, more than 26 years ago, uh, was a, a groundbreaking moment where we adopted a blueprint with very specific demands for women all over the world. Because before that, there was nothing that united women around the world on the basic needs that women should have in every country. What Beijing Declaration uh, and, and Beijing Platform for Action introduced was a, a blueprint that uh, highlighted the most critical things that uh, women needed. And not just women, but girls. Women, for instance, from Africa in Beijing were very insistent that uh, the girl child has to be profiled as a girl child, not just as a child, because she experiences specific injustices that are only meted to girls. Child marriage happened to girls. Female genital mutilation happens to girls. Uh, being kept away from school is a, a crime that is most common uh, for girls. And of course, there were also many issues that uh, seemed uh, to be taken lightly, but were very traumatic to women like women uh, dying while giving birth. Uh, women die in order for another child to be born. So maternal health created a, a, quite a sprint. And as a result, uh, many countries created women's clinics. What we learned in these last 25 years was that on the issues where government made special arrangements to address them, progress happened. Uh, where they created institutions to address those issues, progress happened. Not perfect progress, but progress nevertheless. Girls' education did not become perfect. Many girls are still out of schools and dropping out, but many more girls 
are now at school as a result of the changes that were made uh, then. And of course, saddest in the pandemic, it is these areas where we were making progress that the pandemic has hit the hardest. The pandemic has been much harder on those with the least possibility to defend themselves. Violence against women increased sharply during the pandemic. Uh, access to health facilities for people who needed healthcare, in fact, for everyone who has any other disease other than COVID, uh, experienced uh, challenges in accessing hospital. The burden of care of women who ended up having to care for much more at home for children, for old people, for disabled people, in the absence of infrastructure in the countries that takes care of the people who need it, 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 that care. So all of these things have made us want to make this a, a big call. Generation equality should have happened in 2020, but it was just not possible because all of us were much more concerned about staying alive and we've invested all our energy in that, but we never lost out on a generation equality. What we want in generation equality is that anyone who participates commits. Uh, we are not accepting people to be part of generation equality without making a commitment. We are uh, also uh, presenting generation equality as multi-stakeholder. It is not an intergovernmental forum because when we negotiate as governments, we end up with the lowest common denominator because you have to find the language and all the other nuances that will make all the countries agree. In that process, you actually go down and down and down. In generation equality, we wanted to give ourselves the permission to be bold and to have a high ambition on the things that we wanted to achieve. So generation equality is for private sector, is for member states, is for youth, is for philanthropists, academics, and anyone else who cares to join and who cares about accelerating gender equality. We have all those stakeholders and they've been working with us all this way. Generation equality is also intergenerational. We have brought in young people front and center of generation equality. We say everyone in this generation, the oldest person on earth and the youngest is part of this generation that should bring about the changes we are talking about. But the youth are really at the center of this. They will be the ones that will stand forward and take the, the, the work forward. Generation equality has six themes uh, that we are working with. Gender-based violence, women's leadership, innovation and technology, climate, economic justice, women's leadership. And then we have a basic uh, a compact that is only for women who live in war conditions because these days we have many more women who live in conditions of war or post-war compact for women, peace, security, and humanitarian. And this is what Generation is about. And this is what we will be launching in uh, Paris. And we are not looking forward to speeches in Paris. We're looking forward to commitment. When people, someone opens their mouth, they must tell us what they are gonna do. We're done talking. So thank you so much, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for Mzile. So um, we, won't, we won't have uh, time for question right now, but uh, of course, any question on the comment part will, will, will go to you straight away for you to answer to. And uh, so action, we love action from Mzile. So we are really back just behind you. Uh, we are backing you, uh, so I uh, remind it's uh, from June 30 to July 2nd, Generation Equality Forum, UN Women in Paris, and you'll have the connection, the link on the comments to if you want to take action and go ahead on the, 
uh, on all these uh, very important things. Thank you again, um, Funzile. Thank you. Um, yeah, okay. Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, the media industry plays, as you know, a strong part in the way all those things are perceived. Uh, the way we organize our content, uh, we manage a balance, a fair balance uh, in between the gender in or experts or other ways to ensure equality of treatment between men and women. You are going to meet three journalists involved in their newsroom to rebalance their coverage and provide a fairer representation of our word. So um, I am introducing you to Francesca Donna, uh, who is a gender editor of the New York Times, who kindly co-editorialized this event with Spark News. And around Francesca, you'll meet Dorcas Muga, gender editor of the Daily Nation in Kenya, uh, Tsutomi Ichiai, deputy manager editor of Asai Jinpun in Japan, and Regula Maserli, editorial manager at SFR in Switzerland. Uh, Francesca, the floor is yours. Wow, that was an amazing speech from Fumzile. We're done talking. I feel like we should just turn off our laptops now and make commitments. Um, I'm so honored though, we are gonna do a little bit more talking and I am so honored to have these three extraordinary editors here with me today. We're gonna to talk about gender representation in the news. And what does that mean? Who tells the news? Whose voices do we hear? Whose stories do we tell? I opened my email this morning and was greeted with this statistic. It, to be fair, was from 2016. The global media monitoring project showed that 82% of news articles around the world were about men. For years, for years and years and years, the news has been told from limited perspectives, mostly male. The narrative is starting to change, but it is an uphill battle. There are traditions to contend with, the way things are done, there's stereotyping and assumptions, there are blind spots, there's deep cultural entrenchment. But there are also changes in the, new, in the news landscape that are making the news more representative. And I'm really glad that that statistic is from 2016. I don't have a statistic from 2021, but I know, I know that there are people who are making changes in their fields. And today I'm delighted to introduce three of them who are gonna be talking about what they're doing at their news organizations to make them more representative. Um, I'm also really thrilled because this panel is so very global. Um, I'm gonna use first names, they've all agreed to that, that's the American way, and also we don't have a lot of time, so I can't, I have to dispense with Mr. and Mrs. and formalities. But um, Tsutomi is from Japan, from Tokyo, uh, Regula is from Switzerland, and Dorcas is from Kenya, um, and I am uh, in the US, so I feel like we have a really, really great global kind of cross-section of what is happening in the media today. Dorcas, you're up, I'm gonna begin with you. You are the gender editor at the Daily Nation in Kenya. And you have told me in the past that some of the other editors refer to you as Madam Gender. I can't decide if that is a good thing or a bad thing. I'm curious when other editors see you, do they run away and hide when they see you coming their way? And what are you usually coming to tell them? Um, thank you, Francisca. Um... Okay, um, first I'm happy to hear from Funzile. Um, we are done talking, so we are supposed to talk about commitment. And so, um, yes, <laughs> I have colleagues who refer to me as Madam Gender. Um, initially, um, I took it with a negative, uh, um, uh, I looked at it from a negative perspective, but I'm um, beginning to take it positively because um, I've realized that now they're accepting me and they know 
um, that my work there is not really to to sideline the male gender, but basically to bring about gender equality and to tell stories about both men and women um, in an equal manner to give both the genders an equal voice. Um, and so I take it positively because they know um, our objective basically as a newsroom or as a media house for that matter is to mainstream gender reporting on all our platforms. And we need someone to, to constantly remind us when we sleep a bit um, that we need to toe this line. This is how we are going to achieve this particular objective of um, giving every gender an equal platform, giving every gender an equal voice um, to be heard, to speak, and to be seen. Um, so at the end of the day, uh, our consumers, our listeners, our viewers, our readers feel like they're actually equally represented. At the end of the day, my colleagues in the newsroom, both the ladies and the gentlemen feel that they are equally represented and they have an equal um, platform where they can all tell their stories. And I'm, maybe I'm proud to say uh, something I've not said before is that I actually receive a lot of stories from my male colleagues now, uh, as opposed to initially. Um, I, I should actually say like 70% of the stories that I get on a daily basis are from um, my male colleagues. And that is quite um, commendable. So we are not yet, not yet there um, yet, but we are getting there. And so the name Madam Gender to me, um, it, it empowers me and I take it, I've decided to take it positively. And I want to believe that even those who refer to me as such uh, are doing it, um, of course, with a light touch. Um, sometimes they'll tell me, oh, now you're here to harass us with your, with your women's stories. And I'm, I'm, I, I, I keep reminding them, it's not, gender is not about women. It's about both men and women. It's only that women have been marginalized for a long time and therefore we need to bring them up a bit so that we get that balance and we feel that we're equally represented. And so um, I, I think uh, everything just looks positive, everything looks upward and um, looking forward to a time where now uh, the commitments that we'll be talking about in, in, in a few weeks in France um, will actually be implemented across the board. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Gender. Thank you. Um, I love I love how we are finding the good in that. Um, it can be extremely challenging and um, sidelining, honestly, to cover gender. Uh, Tsutomo, I'd love to go to you next. Um, my understanding is that your work in the gender space began with a gender declaration. And I'd love to hear a little bit from you what was included in that at the outset and whether it's evolved with time. And then, I'm sorry, you can see I'm packing in all my questions. I'm wondering if you can see a time when a gender declaration would no longer be needed. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Francesca. It's really an honor to be here today. And uh, also greeting from a country uh, with a ranking of 120 out of 156 in terms of gender violence, you know, just recently announced by the World Economic Forum. Over Japan is ranked as number three in the economy and a uh, member of the G7 country. But uh, about talking about the gender equality, it's really, really raw. Uh, so uh, today I can maybe speak something about uh, the reasons and also uh, talking about our own efforts. Uh, that is uh, the gender equality declaration, which you talk about, Justice. Uh, and we have announced this declaration last April. Uh, so we have started uh, this uh, project for about one year, some months. And uh, uh, why uh, we started this uh, project? Because, uh, uh, you know, when we talk about gender equality in Japan and we, uh, as a media, sometimes criticizes of the, uh, you know, uh, uh, lacking of uh, uh, awareness and sometimes, you know, sexist remarks by the politicians. But at the same time, we have to look back uh, ourselves. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, Media, media, country, media companies is not an exception uh, for you know this issue. Uh, so first of all, we check uh, the balance. Uh, for example, our leadership uh, position in management and ed ed editors, uh, when we started, uh, like twelve percent uh, by women. Uh, so and also you know some of the uh, panelists of the uh, symposium of the. Uh, 
uh, international, international conference hosted by us annually, uh, sometimes, you know, uh, gender balance is not well, well balanced, like all, you know, uh, aged men and uh, just a few, you know, young ladies, uh, those imbalance, not only in gender, but also in generations. And so we, uh, uh, you know, our efforts is not only uh, to the outlet, I mean, uh, our articles uh, to express ourselves, but also uh, look into our internal, you know, efforts to, to improve our management or uh, towards more uh, gender equality. So we set up like uh, four major goals uh, to target goals. For example, we uh, daily published an article, a uh, feature article about uh, a person in news uh, called Hito means person every day we focus on one person who got some award or who uh, you know invented something or who did something who did some good achievement and uh, uh, last year when we started this project uh female uh, uh you know percentage uh, of that uh, feature article consists uh 28.4 percent then we target we set up target goals at least 40. now uh Last year, uh, I don't know, 2000, 2019, uh, 28% fall. And then after started this project uh, last year, uh, we achieved 40.8% uh, 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 female, I mean, women. Uh, so in that sense, uh, we targeted the goal. And the second goal is about uh, the panelists and participants of the uh, symposium uh, of us. Uh, 2019, 35.8% uh, are women, but now 41.8% uh, are women. So uh, it's also improving. We're not not yet, you know, fully 50-50, but uh, it's it's okay. And about the percentage of the leadership position by female workers, uh, from 12% to 13.3%. So uh, this is really, really. Uh, very uh, little improvement. Although we still uh, we have uh, about twenty percent uh, of female workers out of you know the whole workers. So out of twenty percent, uh, now we have thirteen point three percent in leadership position. And lastly, uh, we encourage also men to have more uh, paternity leave. Mm -hmm. And in that respect, it's really uh, going worse uh, from seventeen point two percent of. Then last year uh, marked 12.3 percent. I don't know if maybe because of the uh, coronavirus, uh, the lack of you know birth rate is uh, uh, you know going down, so uh, uh, less opportunity to have this uh, paternity leave. But uh, this is also something uh, has to be done more for the quality. Uh, so uh, again, as in conclusion, uh, we need to do many things, uh, not only you know uh, as a society, but also or as media to improve the gender equality. And uh, or when we look back our experience, sometimes we say you know or affirmative action is not necessary, or uh, you know quota system is not working, but it worked because we set up the goal and we try to achieve the goal, and we achieved it. Some of them. So uh, uh, I think this is uh, really the case uh, uh, and examples uh, to improve uh, gender equality, not only in uh, society, but also in media in Japan. Uh, so this is uh, our example. Thank you so much. Those are, those are fantastic examples. And it just goes to show, I think, that sort of putting numbers, measuring and putting numbers, I think we often, especially journalists, we have a tendency to speak about in anecdotes and, oh, I've heard this or anecdotally, these are the stories. But I think when you see the numbers, it can be really alarming and, and actually put a goal to to achieve and i think having those goals probably you know did actually made the difference that you were able to reach 40 percent in some of those those cases that you referenced um regular i'm going to move to you actually um i think since we're talking about kind of numbers and representation you know i i would like to just just talk a minute about who we quote in the news um is it always men? Is it men and women in equal numbers? And you and I have talked a little bit about this. I'd, I'd love for you to share with our audience what you found in your newsroom, um, who you're quoting, in what fields and how, and then talk just for a few minutes about what you're doing practically speaking to address that imbalance. You're muted, of 
Yes, I am. Sorry. Hello, everybody. Nice to see you and to hear you. So, um, in Switzerland, I'm working for the public news uh, broadcast company. So we are sharing the 5050 project of BBC, what you probably know already. We started with that about one year ago. And um, we are on our way. We are not yet very successful. Everything goes a bit slow sometimes in Switzerland. As you know, the women's vote only came in 1971, the right for women to vote. So we have a lot to do. <laughs> so we started with that BBC 5050 project with the aim of to see and to hear and to read as many women as men in interviews, uh, in our text, in our uh, stories. And um, yes, we are on our way. I am sometimes, I'm not Mrs. Gender like you, uh, Dorcas, <laughs> but I am sometimes a bit the annoying colleague from over there who says, did you think about looking for a woman into your partner? <laughs> that's, a, that's a bit my role. But I feel I'm not, I'm not alone. I'm really, we are moving, we're going together forwards. And now that make, makes me really happy. We have, our company has like publicistic guidelines, like our code of conduct. And there it is written now, that's very new, that we want as many women as men in our emissions. And that's really a good, uh, a good principle and the reason is not just being nice or being uh, in the time it's really it's it's about journalistic quality and that's our big that's our big um, thing we our quality will get better when we have more women when we our when we show a diverse diverse society and that includes enough women so now i see sometimes it's difficult even in the daily business i see for tv for for my emission 730 we are a daily news program and we go fast and sometimes it's really difficult to find in short time a new interview partner because the men are here they are, normally they are here they have they have a routine and they are prepared to to give an interview so we started to 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 change the workflow in the planning phase. We are looking for women. We are look, we're put, putting a database. Uh, we're putting names together, women who are, uh, who are competent, who are ready to give interviews. And that's why now we started to go directly proactive to, the, to our stakeholders, to the big companies, to the federations, associations. And we go to them and explain our aim. We explain them 50-50, what is about. And we ask them to list women, to give us women as interview partners. And um, I just started with that project. I just contacted about five companies yet, but it's not, we are on the very beginning because we have a long list of, of, uh, of uh, interviews we, should, we will do. But that makes me really happy. I feel that these companies, I see that door is open, our ears are open. I feel that these companies or federation, they want to show women representing themselves. And that's, well, we're still on the beginning, but that makes me really happy. That makes me hope that I feel um, things are changing and not only we want more women, but also our, uh, our injury partners, our stakeholders. Totally, and it sounds like you've had a really good response. Um, I'm getting notes that we really don't have much time. Um, we knew it was gonna be tight, but I want to, raise two quick things. Um, I, I, I really, really want to talk to you, Dorcas, and then you uh, to Somi. Um, you know, Dorcas, you've spoken to me a little bit about the feeling among old school editors that women can't really handle hard stories, that they're not cut out for it intellectually, or they can't manage situations that could escalate into violence. I, I would like it if you if you don't mind and, and speak quite quickly. What do you say to these people or even women themselves who say that this hard journalism isn't women's work? And quite quick, if you don't if you don't mind. Dorcas. Oh. Mute, maybe. Is she muted? Dorcas, you're muted. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, yeah. So um, I'm saying that, of course, there are the old school journalists who believe that um, there are certain stories women can't handle. Um, but times are changing. We are getting more empowered women, uh, thanks to the uh, trainings that we keep doing. Um, and so 
uh, currently we have a number of uh, female uh, journalists who are doing those so-called hard stories or difficult stories to handle, political stories, sports stories. We have um, sports reporters, um, both on broadcast and on print, and who are doing a tremendous job. In fact, one of our sports reporters recently won an award for the, for the work that she's doing. Uh, but back to my um, so-called old school colleagues. Um, you see, everything is changing. Um, the, the, the world is changing globally. Um, our news reporting is going digital. Um, so that not so much is being done on print basically. And we have a new generation of journalists coming up who are more empowered as opposed to the, you know, the traditional journalists. And therefore um, they have what it takes. Uh, when you go to our colleges, um, where the training takes place, you find that there's so many women, actually, there are more women than men in the media schools. But when you get to the newsroom now, yes, you'll find the women, but they're, um, you know, they're basically the junior reporters and all. Um, but what, um, like at, at, um, uh, at Nation Media Group, what has happened is that now we have an executive editor. Our executive editor is a lady and she's really um, empowering the women so that now we have quite a number of women in, um, in middle management positions where they can make decisions on what kind of stories to be done. They can make decisions on who to send to the field to cover what kind of a story. Um, and also um, ensuring that even the young journalists, the new journalists joining the newsroom, uh, get to understand that um, they have what it takes to cover any kind of story. So there's that empowerment, there's mentoring of the younger girls, the younger reporters, the younger journalists, and just reminding them that um, uh, they're equal to the task. And there is nothing that a male colleague can do that they cannot do. Um, so that consistent training, consistent um, mentoring, um, eventually we hope will, will, will lead us to that platform where now um, it, it will be, it will not be um, uh, a dog. I mean, man, man bite dog society when a woman uh, does a page one story on the newspaper, for example, a page one story that is a political story where there's a, a rally going on and a woman's byline is the one that um, uh, tells that story. Um, and at the same time, also the same, same uh, um, old school journalists, they, 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 they tend to you know, they have this thought that everything is about women. When you tell a story, when you get the voices out there, you speak only to the men. Because if you're talking about um, discussing political issues or when the budget has been read and you want people to internalize what, what is in the budget, you can only speak to the men. Um, we are encouraging the reporters to also go to the women. I mean, they have what it takes. They can digest this information to the readers and make it as easy as possible to the local um, uh, in the community to understand what it's all about. So it's just about empowering across the board. Absolutely. I'm, I'm really, really getting in trouble on the timing. Um, and I, 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 but I just can't not ask this question of you, Tsutomu, because I, I found that we had quite, a, you had sort of a similar thought about what it's like for female journalists in Japan. You had said that many women, um, female journalists in Japan are really struggling when covering politics in particular. And then later on experiencing just a double standard of not being able to work because they're also trying to take care of their family. If I may ask you to be really short because there's other people who need to speak after us, but if you can speak to that to the best of your ability in a very limited time, please. Okay, yeah, I try to make it short. Uh, of course, I mean, uh, there are so many issues about uh, you know gender inequality in Japanese Japanese politics. And uh, uh, still, you know, most of the politicians are dominate, dominated by male. Currently, the uh, only three uh, female ministers out of the 20 cabinets. And uh, also, uh, female uh, reporters has to deal with those old-aged uh, male ministers. And sometimes they have uh, sexist ideas and, uh, or, you know, very much outdated idea. They thought it's conservatism, but it's not conservatism. It's really uh, outdated feudalistic, uh, you know, ideas sometimes. So we we'll, we'll really uh, have to uh, change their minds uh, through uh, so many ways. Uh, for example, introducing uh, the world trend 
uh, because we are keen to the uh, atmosphere of the world trend. And so in that sense, I think the coming, uh, the Tokyo Olympics and the Paralympics would be a good opportunity to know uh, how the, uh, the world see uh, the current situation of uh, Japan in terms of gender equality. And uh, the Olympics and the Paralympics is not only uh, the, uh, the sport event, it's really the event uh, to empower all the people, including women, and uh, also uh, care for the human rights and democracies. So in that sense, uh, this is really good opportunities. And also uh, this, uh, the coronavirus uh, could be the game changer in Japan too, because uh, usually our uh, way of coverage uh, to the politics and the politicians, uh, we prefer face-to-face -face meeting. But now mm -hmm. we, can, we can't do that. So uh, we uh, more like to tend to t send text messages and uh, or uh, phone conversations, which uh, makes uh, the female journalist, uh, you know, possible from, uh, from the house while uh, they are taking care of their kids. And also, you know, still taking care of the kids. <laughs> but also, also male journalist has to stay home. So they have to take care of their own kids and, uh, you know, cooking and, you know, do some other home, home workings as well. So uh, I think this uh, could be the game changer for the, for the better. Thank Interesting. You. Well, I think we all agree everyone, well, maybe not women, but others should be doing more unpaid labor, definitely. Thank you so much. I wish we had an hour. I wanted, I have so many more questions to ask you, but I really, I can't because we have to move on to the next panel. So I'm so grateful for your time. You were all extraordinary. And um, I look forward to meeting you one day <laughs> when we can talk more. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Francesca. Thank you all. You've been really, really interesting. We had a privilege to, to hear you. And I think it's good for all the journalists listening to you all over the planet to think that some may be ahead, but some know that they have the, they've got a lot to do again. And we are all on the same boat. But the thing, what is good is everyone is moving on. That's great. Thank you again. Thank you all. So uh, many of the points you've raised also apply to the representation of women in uh, the collective subconscious. Art, movies, books, painting, loads of female representation can mislead and deliver the wrong message about gender equality. So we're going to see two, uh, we're going to meet two women right now. One is uh, Lucina Di Meco, gender equality expert of women's rights advocate, uh, sorry, and women's rights advocate. She co-founded the global initiative She Persisted against gendered disinformation. And uh, we're going to meet Anastasia Mikova, the director, screen, water, screen writer and journalist, you know, the one who produced a beautiful short video we saw at the beginning of this live. So let's have a chat with uh, Lucina and Anastasia, please. Digital technologies promise to change our world for the better. But the same platforms that were once celebrated for their equalizing potential have failed to deliver on their promises. And they have profoundly failed women, particularly women in politics, journalism, and women of color, who every day face horrific volumes of online abuse, threats, and gender disinformation campaigns. The evidence is overwhelming and the consequences are far reaching as many brilliant women renounce running for office and refrain from speaking out, while illiberal actors and authoritarians are becoming ever bolder in their strategic use of social media to silence opposition, roll back women's rights and erode the democratic institutions. So where do we go from here? First and foremost, we each must use our power to be of influence. Governments, civil society and philanthropists must be much bolder in demanding the adoption of better digital platform standards that take into account the real life harms that women face online. And we must insist in getting more than empty promises from social media companies. A better digital media environment is possible, urgent and necessary for achieving gender equality worldwide. Together, we can make it happen. Hi, I'm Anastasia.
Anastasia Mikova, and I'm a film director. With Jan Artus Bertrand, we have created a film which is called Woman. It gives a voice to 2,000 women in 50 different countries. Actually working on this film for the very first time, I physically felt that invisible bond that links all of us women from all around the world. I could finally understand what the words sorority, sisterhood really mean. But what I also discovered is how much violence there still is and how many discriminations women still have to face. And my field, cinema, is not an exception. Only 25% of films here in France are directed by women. And even though this number sounds very low, it's actually the highest one in Europe. And so if women's voices are not heard, if our vision is not represented, how can we really you know, uh, reach change? How can we really uh, reach gender equality? I truly believe that cinema and art in general are the best way or maybe one of the best ways to change the mindsets. But for this, we need more diversity. We need more women to express their vision. We are half of the humanity, so why are we not there represented at the fair level? And with Jan, we wanted to create change on our level, so we created an NGO which is called Woman, Woman with a little s, and all of the benefits of our film, of our film, will go to this NGO to train women to media professions from all around the world. Because you know, if we don't do anything, we actually need another 120 years to reach gender equality. I don't have them, and I don't think you have them too. I believe we can all create change. It, we don't need to wait for tomorrow. We can do it now. So let's join our forces and create change today. Thank you. So, as uh, we said, women's representation in society from the media to politics and the art and culture industry is not just uh, an ideal or a nice to have. It is a central pillar of society and directly affects our ability to cope with issues. And the climate issue is no exception. So what is interesting to know is women are disproportionately uh, affected by climate change but they are the first to act and find solution. To talk about this, uh, we are very lucky to have uh, no, our two next guests, Jennifer Morgan, Executive Director of Greenpeace International, and Fiona Ave, uh, Environment Correspondent at The Guardian. Please, ladies, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for that uh, introduction. And uh, yes, I'm going to be interviewing uh, Jennifer, um, who is the executive director of Greenpeace International and has had a, a fantastic career um, at various uh, NGOs and think tanks and really a ringside seat uh, in looking at climate change and the way that the world has reacted to climate change, the way governments have dealt with climate change. Um, so Jennifer, you're in, in a brilliant position to be able to tell us um, about this issue of gender and climate change. And the first question I think is why we even need to think about this, because climate change, the climate crisis affects everyone. Um, so why is it uh, even a, a, an issue in, in women's terms and gender terms? Well, I think there's two reasons. The first is that women and when Greenpeace speaks about women, um, we're talking about trans, non-binary and cis um, gender, but women are um, most impacted by climate change. So if you look at displacement, 80% of the people have been displaced by climate impacts around the world are women. Uh, if, you, you know, if you look at um, uh, the linkages between kind of women who are often 70% um, of the world's poor are women. Uh, so if you're looking at the climate impacts hitting hard, then women and girls are particularly vulnerable. Um, but the second reason is because of the, of the fact that we need to get out of this crisis and that women are particularly well-placed for a range of different reasons to be the solutions makers, uh, both on increasing the resilience on the ground, but also in 
um, you know, bringing forward sustainability, whether it be on corporate boards or uh, within government. And how can women do that? I mean, if you're talking about women being on the front line uh, of climate change, um, how can we empower uh, those women, first of all? Well, I think the first, you know, one thing to understand um, is that the system that has created climate change has also the same system of uh, dominant groups, mostly uh, so men, um, who have created inequality, who have created systemic racism. And so I think one piece of, of empowering or engaging is actually to have that realization and then to be working together uh, to make that kind of systemic change where you have the well-being of women and girls and people as a whole uh, to be prioritized over kind of the short-term profit of the dominant groups of society who are trying to hold on to power. And I think once you, you know, make those connections, the community is massive uh, and you can build uh, power and build, um, you know, act activism uh, on the ground to be challenging those, those systems of power. And women face particular difficulties doing that, though, don't they? Um, if we're talking again about women on the front line uh, of climate change, trying to defend uh, their environment uh, in, in local areas and so on, women face a lot of danger, physical danger, trying to do that sometimes, don't they? Oh, they absolutely do. And I think we've seen recent work happening as far as um, during COVID crisis, the absolutely despicable increase uh, of those dangers. Um, it's almost like when uh, studies that are coming out that are showing that, that men often will use a crisis to reassert control um, and dominance to erase well-earned women's rights. So you have um, kind of these multiple, multiple risks and dangers that are there, uh, which, which make it very challenging. And in certain parts of the world, I mean, I am a I'm very privileged and I have experienced what it's like to be a white woman from the global north. I have more access. I have more safety uh, than marginalized women who are out there on the front lines. Yes, I, th I think there was a report last year as well by uh, IUCN uh, saying that uh, gender and uh, climate change uh, are, are linked in the way that there are, uh, there's an increase of, in violence against women in areas that are under climate stress. Uh, and so on. So yeah, as, uh, these issues are, are really interlinked for a lot of uh, people. Um, what about, you talked about uh, women in positions of influence and power in boardrooms uh, and so on. What's happening there? Because that's the other side of this, isn't it? Um, we talked about women on the front line, but also a lot of the, the solutions to this problem are going to have to come in the worlds of, of high finance, uh, and big business and so on, because we need to get them to stop emitting. So what's going on there? Well, it's really interesting. I was just reading a, a new, from a new initiative from women in tech um, that have um, started a, a, a whole program of, of work for uh, women, moving women more into boardrooms um, with the uh, understanding from be behavioral economics and studies there that there are different attitudes of men and women to things like risk. Uh, and that actually the corporate boards uh, that have more gender diversity in their boards are able to manage sustainability questions and risks and climate risks better. Uh, so I found that really fascinating actually. So I think what's happening there, and this is one of the challenges I think for women in the field, is um, that there are boards that are trying to attract uh, women into those positions. I think it's really important uh, that women um, make sure that they're going on to boards that are really part of the solution, um, uh, not fossil fuel boards, but actually those that are really trying to change that system. Um, because I think going on to a, a board that's, that wants to maintain the status quo will be a waste of her time because uh, there are big power struggles going on there right now, as you know. Great. So actually the empowerment of women um, that a lot of us are, are, are seeking in, in all aspects of life is actually going to help save the planet. Indeed. Indeed. I mean, I think what, what, we're, what, what the studies are showing um, and research is that actually investing in gender equality is 
actually a multiplier for uh, reducing emissions. Um, you, the, the approaches that women take on the ground, whether it be oftentimes in farming on the ground or within high powered uh, board meetings, um, or I would say in the Paris uh, negotiations, I don't think we would have a Paris agreement without the women who were in positions of power and influence there, um, are also about saving the planet. Uh, so the more women in power and the more women who are empowered, I think increases our chances. So that needs to be a priority. And, and I think it's starting to be recognized more within the climate change negotiations, but uh, certainly not enough. Yeah, that's a really interesting point because, um, yes, as you say, uh, it was really noticeable uh, at Paris and at various other international uh, climate meetings held by the UN uh, that women have often taken a very central role. We had the uh, chief of the UN uh, climate, uh, uh, the, well, the UN's climate chief, rather, um, at Paris uh, was a woman, Christiana Figueres, and the chief French negotiator, Laurence Tubiana, uh, at Paris was a woman. Women have been in these very influential positions when it comes to the climate change negotiations. But has that come through in action? Is there enough uh, within uh, the Paris Agreement and within the current UN talks that are going on? We're heading up to a very important conference called COP26 later this year, uh, where a lot of the uh, parts of the Paris Agreement will be put into full implementation. Um, is there enough recognition within those complex negotiations of uh, where women need to be and what needs to be done for women? No, there's not. I mean, I, I think uh, the two women that you mentioned, I think are, were fundamental. And I think the, the role that they played in a, I would say a more a collaborative uh, approach, which is essential if you're negotiating with so many countries to try and get solutions was, was essential. But now, it's about making decisions. It's about who you listen to. It's about whether uh, politicians are, are listening to their youth, to, to women, um, rather than to the shorter term uh, corporate interests that are trying to keep and hold on to that power. And right now what we're seeing is that that's, that's not yet the case. That power shift has not yet occurred where those voices are uh, either heard or in central leadership positions. We're behind, the world is behind on uh, where it needs to be on uh, implementation of phasing out fossil fuels, uh, implementation of reducing um, deforestation. And those are the key things that, that need to step up and have those voices. I don't, I don't know about you, but when I, when I meet with um, youth activists, the vast majority are women and young, young women and girls. It's really amazing. And uh, so let's get them up there because uh, the politicians right now are, are not doing the job. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. You look at people like Greta Thunberg and other um, activists who are really leading the way on this. And in fact, when you go to uh, one of these UN climate meetings or COPs uh, as they're called, um, it's really noticeable that uh, women are hugely well represented among the activists and among the indigenous people um, and you know, among the civil society groups who are there. Um, and yet when you get into the halls when the negotiation is happening, it's men in suits all the way. Um, and in fact, I mentioned COP26, which is the next UN climate meeting coming up this November in Glasgow. In fact, the UK, which is hosting that, is sending an all male team what kind of signal do you think that sounds? I just was speechless when I heard this. And there have been efforts from leading women around, around the world. There are so many uh, in the UK, uh, certainly, uh, but also elsewhere, uh, women leaders in these fields. And it, to me, it just shows that we still have so far to go. If, uh, if the UK presidency has an all-male team, you know, the, the patriarchy is strong. The, rec the, the lack of awareness of the importance of the diversity of perspectives, the importance uh, of that kind of, of inclusion, um, it just, uh, you know, we've, we've got a ways to go. I'll just say that. <laughs> That's great. Well, we're coming to the end of our time, but I'd just like to ask you one final question on that, which is, you know, we've got COP26 coming up in Glasgow. Um, what's the most important thing do you think can happen there? for women when we're looking at the climate fight? I think the most important thing that can happen there for women is that uh, governments come forward and, and 
double down and put forward the not only the goals, but actually the action plans that will more than have global emissions by 2030, because that will reduce the damages that are hitting women uh, most, most terribly around the world. Jennifer, thank you very much indeed. Thank you for taking part. It's been a great conversation. Thank you. Great to be with you. Thanks. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank you, Fiona. Sometimes I feel ashamed to be a man. We need At you least... too. You can be proactively anti-misogynist, uh, yeah. and I'm sure you are. So that's I am. Great. At least I don't we have a suit you. on. That's one thing. <laughs> But, well, thank you both for reconnecting the dots between the two major challenges of society have to address if we want to build a truly sustainable world. So thank you very much You're to welcome. you both. <laughs> uh, moving on, uh, women, women act. That's for sure. They do. They do indeed. So I um, don't know if you know, if you heard about the Women for Climate Initiative uh, by the C40 Leaders for Climate. They empowers and in inspires the next generation of uh, climate leaders. So let's hear from them. And um, we are lucky enough to have a little uh, moment with Mayor Aki Sawia of Freetown in Sierra Leone. Uh, she's a woman for climate champion and she's putting words into action. Please uh, have a time with a uh, woman for climate. Climate crisis affects us all. Climate change is real. But those who've done the least to cause it are paying the highest price. It's hurting the poor, the elderly, people of color, women and children the most. We need the people and communities who are most vulnerable and most impacted to be involved in decision making. We can't have climate justice without social, racial or gender justice. We need women to be at the table, in office, in the streets. Leading the charge for transformative change. We need you to join our network of climate leaders. We are Women for Climate. From Barcelona. Auckland, Freetown. Lima. Please bring London. Montreal. Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Mexico City. Sydney. New Orleans. Paris. Kingdom. Toronto. Tel Aviv. Vancouver. We work in waste, sustainability, in urban experimentation, marketing, clean energy, renewables, green finance, textile. Our projects are helping to build safe, resilient, and equitable cities. And a future that includes everyone, no matter where you live or who you are. Through the Women for Climate Mentorship Program, we are learning from each other. We share our experiences, our knowledge, our achievements, and our challenges. The Women for Climate community has given me hope. Network, the platform to act. An amazing learning opportunity. Leadership. Empowerment. Conviction. Join us. Join, Join us. us. Join us. us. My name is Ifan Akisoyan, I'm the mayor of Freetown. Climate change is having a devastating impact all around the world and Freetown is no exception. We feel the effects in two ways. The direct effects um, are really shown through abnormally heavy rainfalls in some years and in this year a predicted low rainfall which is going to result in water shortages and in previous years have resulted in mudslides, landslides, loss of property and death. But the indirect way in which we feel the effects of climate change is because these same irregular weather patterns result in crop failures in rural areas and that leads to rural urban migration with people coming moving into the city in unprecedented numbers at a time when we're not able to cope because of a lack of effective development control so we see with the increase in people more deforestation leading to more water shortages we see see vulnerabilities um, increased with those or among those who are seeking a safer life as they make their homes 
on the hillsides, um, along the coastlines, and in places where sea level rises and the same landslides and mudslides make them more vulnerable. What is the way forward? We've got to take action and take it now. And at Freetown City Council, we're doing that with the planting of a million trees within our Freetown, the Tree Town campaign, with our involvement of women in our Women for Climate mentorship program, enabling and facilitating women to develop and deliver their own solutions in their communities, with the introduction of urban farming, which not only helps to green our environment, but provides food, and a source of income for over 500 women-led households. When it comes to, dev to um, disaster mitigation and adaptation, we are also working with women in the lead to improve drainage systems, to do flood mitigation programs, but overall and perhaps most fundamentally, we're making sure that we have women in leadership in our city at all levels so that we're looking at these problems through the lens of those who very often have to carry and deal with the outcome and the fallout of climate change. Speaking of, uh, speaking of uh, women being real players, we're going to talk now about empowerment. Uh, just as uh, the impact of women participation in climate change battle, women's equal economic participation in, is beneficial for the world economy. According to the UN, a 35% increase in global GDP could be achieved by closing the economic gender gap. So for the next session, uh, Alicia uh, Gupta, a gender reporter of the New York Times, uh, welcome to you. You're going to be surrounded by very uh, three uh, uh, leaders in uh, empowerment, let's say. Uh, I mean, specialists in empowerment. We'll have Megan Fallone, who is a board member or, and former CEO of Barefoot College International. Karen Grohn, who is director of the gender division at the World Bank, and Valérie Frey, uh, researcher of the OECD. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bruno. Good evening and good morning, depending on where you're joining me from. I'm Alicia Haridasani Gupta. Um, I'm a gender reporter at the New York Times. Um, by now, it is it is obvious there are plenty of reports and studies all pointing to the same thing. The COVID related employment losses around the world were larger for women than for men. It is one of the first times in history that an economic recession has left more women than men without jobs. And that's because of the unprecedented nature of the crisis that we're dealing with. Women were concentrated in service, education, hospitality, healthcare, and retail industries that were all badly hit when the world went into lockdown. But women were also the ones to shoulder more of the care burden at home, even before the pandemic. So when schools shut down, guess who was the one sacrificing their paychecks and their jobs to look after children? In other words, the system was set up to fail women in this moment of crisis. And I am so glad to have with me Karen, Valerie, and Megan here to dive a little deeper into the data, especially Karen. I know you are on vacation, so I really appreciate your time and taking the day, time out of your day to join us here. So, so let me stick with you, Karen. The World, Track has been, uh, the World Bank has been tracking annually the biggest barriers to full female economic participation. Can you give us a broad overview of the cracks in the system that COVID exposed? Oh, there are so many cracks, Alicia, and you pointed to a number of them. Uh, one that you mentioned, and I'll put it in more wonky terms, is sex segregation in employment. The fact that women are in sectors that have been really, really hard hit, particularly during this pandemic and the nature of this pandemic, which has had lockdowns and shutdowns and reduced mobility, those sectors where women work and hospitality and tourism is one of the contributing factors. But there's also other issues which you mentioned, which is 
uh, social norms, for instance, and the norm that women are largely responsible for caring. And even though we have some time use data that shows that men, men have stepped up, they really haven't stepped up in a way, enough or in a way to take off uh, the, the responsibility for women. And we have some really interesting data from women entrepreneurs that shows that women have spent six hours more per day uh, than pre-pandemic uh, caring for children, which has it affected their businesses. But I also wanna mention legal barriers. The World Bank Group has a publication called Women, Business and the Law. And we actually uh, collected data during the pandemic. We've learned how to collect data remotely. And we have some really interesting uh, data that I thought maybe I could uh, share with you. So um, our most recent report shows that where women have legal um, uh, rights and equal opportunities to access jobs, more women work and earn relative to men. But there are about 88 economies worldwide or women face some sort, form of job uh, restriction. And this can affect the job choices of nearly 2 billion women around the world. And it makes it harder for them to gain employment. Those jobs are in uh, transport or manufacturing or construction, in water or energy. And those are the jobs that men largely hold and that pay more. And even where women can do the same jobs, they're paid less. Our research revealed that in 100 countries, it is legally acceptable to pay women less for equally valued jobs. Uh, in 38 countries, women can be fired because they're pregnant. And although more than half of the countries measure uh, mandated paid leave for fathers, the median duration is only one week. And in my mind, that is actually an issue that we really need to focus on in the recovery. Um, only 44 countries have paid parental leave. And women can't achieve equality in the workforce, as you know, unless they are, uh, if, if they're on an unequal footing at home. And finally, the uh, last thing I wanna say is where women are legally protected from sexual harassment. And I mm -hmm. think this is also important as we remember from the Me Too movement, more women have been found to be able to own businesses and operate businesses but there are 49 countries that don't have laws on sexual harassment in the workplace. So I think there's a very strong case to be mm. made during the pandemic, uh, which we can talk about a little bit later for making legal reforms. Right, of course. Thanks, Karen. That really puts into perspective, 2 billion women are impacted by the laws in 88 countries. You know, it's, it's, when you put number to it, it really uh, is in your face. There's no ignoring it. Um, this is where I want to bring in Valerie. Um, there is one economic study from 2013 that I have read many times now, and you know that's very nerdy of me, but I always turn back to it in my reporting. It compared female labor force participation among OECD countries, and it found that in the U.S., labor uh, female labor force participation stagnated from the mid 1990s onwards, and it grew in other in those other countries. And the reason was because those other countries invested in things like childcare and workplace flexibility, which is something that Karen just mentioned. So I want to ask you, how have mothers fared in the pandemic globally? You know, we touched on this idea of care, but give us some of the numbers there. I'd be happy to. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the invitation and thanks to Spark News for organizing this great event. Um, uh, Alicia, as you said, yeah, I mean, we know across countries that there's sort of been different impacts on women. Overall, women have been negatively affected in terms of employment outcomes, but it's varied a bit by country, especially in OECD countries. These are the wealthiest countries in the world. They tend to have the highest levels of labor force participation. So in a lot of ways, in a global perspective, uh, the OECD countries are sort of the best case scenario. They have the strongest social protection systems and so on. Uh, but one cons consistent lesson that we learned, even in these very wealthy countries, is that mothers were really negatively affected in terms of labor force participation. So looking specifically at mothers with dependent children, they were more likely to leave the labor market than women without children and much more likely to leave the labor market than men were. So that begs the obvious question, why? What's going wrong? So one crucial factor, which Karen just touched upon very succinctly, is these inequalities in unpaid work. So prior to the pandemic, in every country in the world, uh, we know that women were doing more unpaid care work than men. We have some of this data represented in our OECD gender data portal and the social institutions and gender index. But 
just looking at OECD countries, we know on average women do about two more hours of unpaid care work than men every day. And even in countries like Sweden and Denmark, it's still one extra hour per day. So on the one hand, we have this really long-standing, deep, inflexible inequality in unpaid caregiving tasks. And then on the other hand, we also know that women earn less than their male partners on average, right? So from a household finance perspective, it makes a lot more sense that a woman would leave her job uh, if necessary. So then it, I think it came as no surprise to anyone that when schools and childcare shut down, women disproportionately felt this burden. They became the teachers and the child menders of children that would have been going to school or childcare. They're effectively, you know, unpaid agents of the state. Um, and in response, a lot of women left the labor market entirely. Some others cut their hours or their responsibilities. Um, and we have, we have some evidence for this. So uh, in the OECD, we run a survey of 25 countries called the Risks That Matter Survey. And we just asked people, you know, during the pandemic, who took on childcare responsibilities when schools shut down? And 60% of women said that they took on the majority of work and only 21% of men said that. So even if you account for some overestimation of one's time, I think there's a pretty <laughs> clear gap there. Um, and we also see pretty big correlations related to length of school and childcare shutdowns. So in countries that had pretty long lasting school shutdowns like Canada and the United States mm -hmm. where schools mm -hmm. were closed well into 2021, working mothers were really hard hit in the labor market. But in countries where national shutdowns were a little bit shorter, for instance, in France where I am now, schools shut down for about the first three months of the pandemic, we see much smaller job losses among mothers. Um, and we see similar patterns too when we look at closure of childcare facilities so for children who are not yet in school. Um, and I, I would just, I would emphasize too what, what Karen said, we do, time use data are still coming in and I think that's something governments need to do better on. We need to collect more data on what people are doing at home. Um, but when we talk about these inequalities in unpaid work, I'm certainly not saying that men did not contribute. And there are some studies coming out, especially out of the UK saying that fathers did more, especially when both parents were working at home. Um, and this can have good long-term effects. We know this from studies on parental leave that if fathers commit early and they have to put this time in, that we see better long-term outcomes in terms of the division of unpaid work. So if there's a silver lining to all this, that might be it. Um, but on the whole, it's a lot for mothers to recover from. Yeah, you know, and you mentioned schools and childcare centers. Here where I am in the US, we're, we're hitting the summer vacations and you know, that's gonna, that's gonna again hit women harder. Um, summer camps are full. And also there are no childcare centers. All of them, um, so many, a big majority of them shut down during the pandemic because here there is no public childcare system. Um, so before, uh, so I actually wanna bring in Megan here. You know, all of the data we're talking about seems to be clustered around uh, the, the formal labor market, right? What's, what's measured in the GDP, what's measured in the, in the labor force participation. But you have your finger on the pulse um, with women who have far less stability and visibility and they're not, often not counted in those, in those metrics. So what have you been hearing on the ground? Well, uh, Barefoot has been for, for many years working really on agency on economic agency for women, on uh, social agency, and definitely on environmental agency and justice, and how to put women in our most rural and poor communities into a position of equality, in a sense, um, and to really shift the social norms and barriers that stop women from using their voice in all the places that we know their voices need to be heard. So along comes the pandemic, right? And almost everything is disrupted. For, uh, for rural women. And while we sort of have the idea that this pandemic has been a, a universal experience, it actually hasn't. You know, for some rural women, we work in 93 countries. So for some rural women, their lives have remained largely unchanged. Mm -hmm. For other rural women, especially in India, where our, uh, where our headquarters is, obviously the situation for women and girls has been just phenomenally destructive for their trajectory towards agency. I think in, in, in work roles, you know, we think more about familial sharing of work and responsibility and economic um, generation. And, and we know that families really work as a network in a sense, in many cases. Mm -hmm. 
So in this case, um, we have the horrible situation of whole families getting COVID in many instances because they can't get away from each other. There is no isolation. There's not even diagnostics and there's huge stigma. So families drew inward. We don't tell anybody that we're ill. And I mean, that has created enormous challenges in even understanding and controlling the, the spread of the actual virus. Um, and then there's a lot of fear, a tremendous around, amount of fear around that in rural communities where information doesn't flow as easily and where people don't have the levels of education to really understand what's happening to them. So I would say all those things have made it just so much tougher for women in rural poor situations where their mobility is already limited where uh, their access to work is on a daily wage basis. So imagine you're sick for 10 days. That means you don't earn for 10 days. Mm -hmm. You don't earn for 10 days. Your children don't eat for 10 days. Mm -hmm. And it's that immediate. And it's that immediacy, I feel, that, that the world has not quite understood for women, mm -hmm. that that responsibility has been on their back. And, um, and so, so many things have then been disrupted, right? Learning for women, uh, mm -hmm. their, their ability to move in society and, and really increase that, that momentum and trajectory, which I think was really showing some positive signs in lots of countries, that's really come to an end. And then I guess lastly, the thing that we've really seen disrupted and I'm most concerned about is certainly violence against women and, uh, and sexual abuse. Because we now have you know, millions of migrant workers returning to rural communities, the burden on women dramatically increasing, the dynamics socially within their family, within their relationships, within their communities also dramatically shifting, not in a gradual way, but like overnight. Um, and all of that has again put pressure uh, on women and on communities to, to have to combat that in some way, shape or form. So I, I think it's a pretty, a pretty serious situation as I see it in the developing mm -hmm. world and um, most particularly around the progress of women towards better agency. Right. You're so right. You know, it, I mean, the UN Secretary General calls violence against women the shadow pandemic that really surged during during the pandemic it, behind closed doors. And no one really can really put a, uh, a concrete figure on it because you don't know if they can call. You don't know if they can ask for help. Um, but I want to try and look at some of the silver linings here. I know it's also bleak. Um, the report from the World Bank actually had a, a fun statistic that a lot of countries did implement policies that help women. Karen, give me a, a little more on that. I, I think that's really um, important. And I have to say that I think it's no longer just on the last point that Megan made. It is no longer a shadow pandemic. It's out of the mm -hmm. shadows and into yeah. the public discourse. And I think in front of all of us. And I want to just say one word about this. We, we have data. Uh, we're collecting through high frequency household surveys through multiple waves data, including on increases in gender based uh, vi violence, calls to helplines, the administrative data on services. And I think this is one of the things that's really important for countries to prioritize going forward out of the recovery is how do they strengthen their national frameworks and action plans for prevention of and response to gender-based violence. The health sector is clearly a sector that really needs to be prioritized in the recovery. They need to have referral pathways, they need to have trained uh, personnel, and they need to have um, have uh, response, uh, the types of response services and supplies that are really necessary. And some countries are actually doing this. Countries in Latin America where we're working, that we're working with have actually strengthened their frameworks. I can mention some of the countries in the Southern Cone. But more than this, just as you said, Alicia, there's cause for optimism. Despite the adversities of the last several months, at least 27 countries have actually made res uh, reforms to discriminatory laws. So many of the reforms were focused on eliminating job restrictions and also targeting the gender wage gap. Others have passed good practice laws related to marriage and to parenthood or they have actually removed constraints to female entrepreneurship, recognizing the value of female economic activity to global growth and global recovery. Mm. 
But I do have to mention that many laws continue to inhibit women's ability to enter the workforce or to start a business. And many countries still need to reform uh, their restrictions that women face in the type of jobs that they do. For instance, uh, there's still countries that say that women cannot be metro operators and they have mm -hmm. antiquated laws on the uh, <laughs> jobs that require women to carry uh, 35 kilos, uh, which yeah. is absurd when you think about women carrying children who may weigh more than that or the kinds of hours that women can work. So those kinds of reforms are essential. Mm -hmm. But they also need to do, I think, three other things. Um, the US has just done this, and I think it's instructive. They need to make care services part of economic infrastructure and part of economic recovery. And they need to do that by helping make uh, care affordable and accessible, as well as providing standards for quality of care, because parents won't put their children in child care unless they know that it's a quality service. So we really need to roll up our sleeves and put that on our, uh, our lens as much as we have education and health. Mm -hmm. The other two things that I think are important, um, and this goes to some of the comments that Megan made, we need to accelerate digitalization. We know that we cannot survive in the world economy today with access to some kind of mobile technology, having a phone, it may not even be a smartphone or access to the internet. We're working with countries around the world to accelerate digitalization of government services. So even when you think about re education, remote education is key, but it's not gonna reach uh, boys and girls unless girls have access to that uh, technology. And there's 150 fewer million women than men that actually have access to the internet or to digital services. Uh, this is the data from the GSMA uh, Foundation. And when we think about the kinds of uh, protections and uh, reforms that are needed, as Megan mentioned, when we think about one thing that I think is critical is expanding cash transfers and social protection, particularly to women who are in urban areas who may be day laborers or peace rate workers or to the rural uh, workers that Megan mentioned. Social protection is key, but they, women need to be able to receive that cash via a, a phone. They need to be able to have control over how they use that money. Uh, and what they do with it. So as we think about recovery, digitalization is really key, but it's digitalization with the lens of women, the last mile as the first mile. Mm -hmm. And the final piece is that as part of cash transfers, and this is um, very prevalent in countries like India, we need to think about not just delivering the cash, but delivering the cash plus other services that help women increase their productivity. So we call it cash plus, it's access to savings, access to finance, market support. Um, thinking about, and this hasn't come up yet, thinking about the kind of livelihoods that women are already doing, but in a climate smart way. Where are the green approaches to help women be able to transition for climate mitigation and adaption? And we can do this through social protection services and programs, but we can also do it through um, services that help communities, community development programs, urban planning, all kinds of other things. So I think it's that holistic view of recovery. And this is the lens that I think will help economies become not just resilient, but really sustainable in a green way going forward. Um. Yeah, you're so right, Karen. Actually, you know, you bring up an interesting point about the cash plus, because I know Megan is, Megan mentioned to me that she, uh, that Barefoot College is thinking about this too, because in so many places around the world, women can't get loans. They, they can't own property. They don't have access to credit. Um, so Megan, tell me more about what your help, what you're doing to help there. Yeah, so I think, you know, to build on what Karen's saying, and and there are some amazingly um, hopeful things, obviously, least of which is, is the women themselves who totally amaze me every day at their resiliency and ability to just soldier on and actually thrive in, in really difficult situations. But um, one of the things that I think is good is that these kind of disruptions make you rethink what you're doing as well as what's happening around you. And we as an organization also have really looked deeply in this period at um, how can we step up quite considerably the way that we work with our beneficiaries. And, um, and one of those is to look at asset, asset-based transfer and asset lending. 
um, and to move away, com just completely radically away from a woman needs to have collateral to get a loan. She needs to prove she has assets to get a loan. I think it's time we trust women. I think we know they're going to do right by us. I think they are totally invested in their agri livelihoods in particular and in their livelihoods in general, um, because those are their one way ticket to agency. And so they're protective of them and they nurture them and they care for them. And we need to really bank on that and stop just blah, blah, blah about that, right? So we developed um, a trust-based credit survey. We're using different ways to talk about familial assets and networked assets in communities to be able to think about asset lending that's direct ownership to a woman that of course is bundled with everything from um, the FinTech that allows her to receive digital payments, her financial mm -hmm. inclusion and financial literacy learning um, her ability to network with other women to save and really looking at complexity there and not looking at single siloed solutions, but really how do we co-create with multiple partners to be able to deliver digitally the kinds of comprehensive solutions that I think women need right now. I would completely echo uh, that sort of drive. Interestingly, we also do an, an education program in rural areas mm -hmm. using digital tools. Um, we have done that for quite some years now uh, using things like solar powered projectors and solar powered iPads, if you can believe it. And it's been a very, very successful program. But of course, even those local groups couldn't meet during the pandemic. Interestingly, we started canvassing the families of all the children who participate, and it's mostly girls in our rural programs that participate because they're not allowed to go to school in many cases. And those schools take place in the evening. So a, a girl can help in the household and then still have her school time in the evening. But um, what we found is that actually one smartphone in a family goes a long way. So we were pushing content to the one smartphone that that family had access to. And we found that the whole family was then learning the lesson together, mm -hmm. which you know was something really revelation, a real revelation for us that actually it can't really be dictated that they everybody needs a smartphone, that actually rural people are able to leverage one asset really well. So mm -hmm. children were learning, mothers were learning, there was a lot mm -hmm. more reading happening between mothers and children during the pandemic. So in one way for, for cutout communities, for marginalized communities, I think it's kind of accelerated our evidence that, that there's a lot of scope for familial uh, digital services. Mm -hmm. That is so fascinating. It kind of comes back to that idea that if you lift the, the most vulnerable, you lift everyone, right? Yeah. So you give women a, a phone or an iPad and sort of everyone around her is, is yeah. benefiting from that. And on that note, I, I have to, I'm that I have to wrap this up and I unfortunately don't have any more time. But on that note, um, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Spark News Media, for having us. Um, back to you, Bruno. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, Alicia. And thank you, Megan. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Valerie. I know that we are not yet, are not, uh, we are not there yet, but I can see that we are really moving on, and uh, you are a very good player for that. So thank you for for all the the work. I can really listen a bit of optimism in your conversation. So we will get there. Thank you again. Um, so speaking of uh, women's economic empowerment, we are going now to listen to uh, Melinda French Gates. Uh, co-chair of the Bill and Melinda uh, Gates Foundation. She is uh, going to talk about uh, the worldwide sanitary crisis that affected uh, the situation uh, and uh, how uh, can, we can try to uh, make things better. And uh, we'll have just after that a message from Women, Women Deliver, uh, a leading global advocate championing uh, gender equality. So uh, the floor is to uh, Melinda French Gates right now. Hello. In the 20 years I've been working on development, the spring meetings have never felt more urgent. We all understand that we are in the middle of an international emergency. I hope we also recognize that we have everything we need to respond today in ways that make us stronger tomorrow. In institutions like the bank and the IMF, we have the power to act 
decisively. As a global community, we have the ironclad conviction that growth must be inclusive. It's an issue of fairness, and it's also an issue of good economics. Economic growth cannot be resilient when it leaves so many people out. The only way to rebuild sustainably is to make sure that all people enjoy the opportunity to build wealth and the security to withstand shocks. Let me be specific. This crisis has done disproportionate damage to the women and girls who have been forced to the margins of every economy. If we want to recover quickly and build a solid foundation for the future, we need to put women and girls front and center. That means reopening clinics and schools at full capacity as soon as possible and focus on making up for those missed health checks and lost learning. It means investing in caregiving as an essential infrastructure instead of simply expecting women to provide 30 hours of unpaid care each week. And it means targeting stimulus and social protection to informal workers, the vast majority of whom are women. 26 years ago, the world agreed to the Beijing Platform for Action on Gender Equality. If we had made more progress on it, our communities would have been better prepared to endure this pandemic. This June, the Generation Equality Forum in Paris offers us a second chance to follow through on our promises with political commitment, financing, and policy. I'm asking you here, and again, when we gather in Paris, to make this recovery strong and sustainable by making it equitable. We have the power, we have the conviction, now we must act. Equality cannot wait. Women Deliver is a leading global advocate that champions gender equality and the health and rights of girls and women. Our advocacy drives investment, political and financial, in the lives of girls and women worldwide. Evidence shows us that ensuring women's economic agency is key to combating poverty, improving health, and leading to a more gender equal and sustainable world. Women Deliver is deepening its advocacy to advance women's economic rights and justice as a driver of gender equality through our organizational strategy. This becomes even more pertinent with health and economic crises, including COVID-19, exasperating inequalities. We advocate for policies and programs that protect and advance women's economic rights and justice, including social protection policies around unpaid care, parental leave policies, decent work, and equal pay. We also push to reverse discriminatory laws and practices that disadvantage women and advocate for greater access to both programs and financial resources that help level the playing field for women's economic progress. Here are some examples of our work. With over a thousand members of our Young Leaders program, we provide support for our fierce youth advocates in their own advocacy efforts on women's economic agency in local contexts. Women Deliver conferences have traditionally provided spaces to mobilize collective action on key issues when it comes to economic agency and to launch the latest research in this area. We contribute to the evidence base and investment case for women's economic agency. For example, exploring the impact of having a child before 18. The Deliver for Good campaign, a multi-stakeholder coalition, mainstreams gender equality across the Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, including on SDG 8 on decent work and SDG 5 on gender equality. We see a focus in women's economic justice and rights as a means to advancing gender equality and sexual and reproductive health and rights, and to ensuring that all girls and women in all their intersecting identities can enjoy their rights. Learn more by visiting us at womendeliver.org.
Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you for joining the, the, the live towards equality. Um, hope you've been able to be with us for the last uh, roundtables. We're very, very interesting. Um, now, the next session title is Who Cares for Women? I guess I reckon all of us do so. But uh, we put a little more pressure on our next guest. We're going to talk about it more precisely. So um, I'm happy to welcome uh, Rupa Dat, who is Executive Director for Women in Global Health, who will be moderate the session. And um, she will uh, talk with Nimko Ali Obe, CEO of the Five Foundation, the Global Partnership to End Female Genital Mutilation, uh, Gary Bake Barker, Executive Director of Promundo US, and Delphine O, who is Ambassador and Secretary General of the General Generation Equality Forum uh, at the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Please, uh, Rupa, the floor is yours. Great. Right, well, thank you, Bruno, for such a warm welcome. And what an amazing afternoon. I, I can't believe we're you know, coming to this you know, last session here, but uh, a very exciting one. The topic of who cares for women is one that uh, I personally care very deeply about. And especially this is a moment in our global history to really stop and take stock. We know that COVID-19 has infected around 175 million people. It has caused around 4 million deaths with a higher mortality amongst men. But the pandemic is far from over. It has tipped the world into a deep global recession, felt hardest by countries and social groups with the least protection with women and girls at the center. So we must care for women and girls. We know a shadow pandemic has struck women who have been the first to lose their jobs, experienced both increases in both unpaid work and intimate partner violence. We also know in low income countries, there have been disruptions of maternal and reproductive health services, which have increased in maternal deaths, unwanted pregnancies, unsafe abortions. And at the same time, we also know that women have been on the front lines. They are a majority of the health and care workforce, about 70% around the world, and they're leading the support within their communities. The pandemic has shown we must change the narrative. Women are not only health system users, but they're drivers of change in health and society. And we'll be touching on, upon that today. That being said, though, however, women health and care workers are clustered into lower paid jobs, lower status roles, and paid on average 28% less than the male counterparts, frequently subject to violence, sexual harassment, and marginalized in leadership. It is estimated that women contribute $3 trillion to health annually, and half of that remains unpaid. So the poorest women in the world subsidize health systems with their unpaid work, and it leaves the whole world vulnerable. And so today I have three very inspirational pa panelists who are approaching these issues from very different angles, but very committed to caring about women and changing the narrative for women. And so as we discuss today, how are women agents of change? How, by placing them at the center of decision-making, can we build back more resilient societies for all? So the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed in deep, the deepened inequalities between and within countries, including gender equality. Should we see the pandemic as the latest gender battle with men and win, uh, men as winners and women as losers? Well, I'm going to first turn to Nimco to ask the question. Women are 70% of the health and care workers. We also know that women are advocates within their societies. They're not only health users, they're drivers of change. How do we change the narrative and recognize the work done by women? Um, hi, thank you very much um, for having me on today. I think the key thing, so I um, specifically at the Five Foundation advocating for black African women on, on, on the continent of Africa who are basically holding up half the sky there and who are solemn getting the recognition that, that, that they deserve. I think it's it's really about valuing the work that women do and actually funding that work. We we understand that women are the ones that keep the communities going. We're, 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 women are the ones that do the care at home, but ultimately very little of that is, is actually funded. So what we need to do is actually really change the way that we actually um, value the work of women and, and and it has to be in an economic kind of context and and and, and through an economic lens essentially. Great Nimco that's you know touching upon that like how do you think we can you know really start changing that narrative you know you and investing in um, women especially black women indigenous women and women from the Africa continent. 
Do you know what? I think it's about taking the rhetoric away from wanting to invest in them and then actually doing it. Less than 2% of funding actually goes to women and very little of that goes to black and, Indi- and, and, and indigenous women. As great as philanthropy and the, and, and the international de- development sex- sector is, it is still really racist and, 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 and sexist. So ultimately, in order to change that is that we have to be able to start doing things differently. I think what COVID has done is actually really show that the large I- INGOs and the large organisations and not doing the work that we think they are doing and the work is being done by indigenous and frontline women and for me as an African woman myself I have seen that in on the issue of FGM it is black and African women that are doing the work that is actually saving gen- generations of girls and ensuring that the pandemic has not taken us hold as, as, um, as, as it could on the continent of Africa. And go really, really great point there that women have been the resilience in their communities. So I'd like to turn to Gary next. Gary, you know, we've touched upon uh, women health and care workers have been applauded um, around the world. There's been candles that have been lit. They have an extraordinary contribution to the pandemic, but this is not translated into decent pay, safe work, or equal stay in leadership. How can we change that? And what are we seeing um, really uh, emerging as you represent, um, you know, work on particularly male allyship and what are we seeing um, that men have experienced in this pandemic that can actually transform this agenda? No, I think it's it's obvious that COVID has been a crisis of care um, in our care systems, our health systems, our economic systems, and the inequality brought about by, by COVID has exacerbated the inequalities that were already there, gender-based, region-based, um, historically marginalized groups, ahead. And I think what, what we've also seen in COVID is a lack of imagination and the kind of policies in place to support care full stop in terms of care as a paid profession, but also care at home. Women have, even before COVID, have been doing 3.3 times the amount of daily care of our homes. And I think we've lacked imagination. I'm not just saying supporting that care, which we must, but to say men must do our share. We've got to change even the, the language that we use about it. I'm tired of hearing men must help with care <laughs> and, and turn the language around and said, no, miss, men must do our share of the care. We've looked at social protection policies, for example, where during COVID and before, 150 of them that we reviewed and the funding when their cash transfer is going to women, which makes a lot of sense, and yet no nudges at all to say we need men to do our share of the care work. No country in the world, we just launched our State of the World's Fathers report this week and we'll be sharing it at GF as well. No country in the world has a goal that we've been able to find of men and boys doing half the care work. We have lacked a goal and a vision on that. We have very little advancement of men in in, in paid care professions. We continue to send the message that care is women's work. It starts with girls in the home who do 3.5 times the amount that the brothers do on average. Um, so I think we've got to we've got to figure out a way that this COVID moment helps us reset to see care as center in all of our lives. We need men as politicians to care about care. We need, I mean, paid parental leave certainly is something we need in, in global north countries, and it certainly works for those in um, in the paid in a in a formal work setting, but we need lots of norm shift around making care supported and not just men helping out, but men doing our share. And Gary, can you touch a, a bit of an, upon what you are seeing um, as sort of the sh- transforming mindset amongst men as a result of um, the experiences that men, women, all genders have had in their households? Yeah, I mean, COVID does offer us, you know, if there's a silver lining in this crisis. Um, we know from the studies that, that UN Women and others and some that we've carried out together with Oxfam, men are doing more hands-on care work during COVID school lockdown, changes in work patterns. Many men are kind of on a, you know, obligatory paternity leave by being forced to be at home. That's meant harm for some households where men, where we've seen a spike and increase of violence in some parts of the world and in some households. But at the same time, it has meant that men and sometimes boys are doing more hands-on care work. Now that still comes on top of this inequality. Women were already doing more, everyone is doing more. Women have continued to do more during COVID, but I think we have, we've seen a shift of men seeing care as normal and something that's expected. And I think the big challenge of resuming life post-COVID is to say, will this turn into some long-term changes 
in men's support for care policies, but also men doing our share of care work at home. I think it will pay forward if we make it pay forward, if we deliberately put in place the policies to make those changes stick. I don't think we can just assume that once, you know, that that, that equality is going to fall out of out of this moment if we don't make it happen. Uh, great points there, Gary. Very powerful data. Um, it is refreshing to hear the perspective, um, really not just about you know how it benefits uh, women, but also benefits men and, and the transformation that is uh, taking place as a result um, of the silver lining in this pandemic. And I'd like to turn to uh, Delphine. What an exciting uh, moment. Um, it's so great to have you here as we are in the lead up to the Generation Equality Forum. Um, the government of France has already shown leadership on these issues. Um, I'd like to ask you the same, you know, same question here. We know that women in um, the health and care workforce, especially, but also just women in general, have had extraordinary contributions to the pandemic, build resilience in their communities, um, especially in some of the um, uh, some of the hardest low resource communities. As we've heard from Nimco, we've heard men are also um, having to step up and you know shifting into roles but this is not really translated into policy. We don't see decent pay, we don't see safe work or an equal say in leadership. How can we change that? And, and what role do you see for governments, um, especially in this lead up to generation equality form? Thank you, Rupa. And you know, this is exactly what we've been trying to do with the Generation Equality Forum. We've been trying to use it as a platform, as a catalyzer for mobilization of the governments. We had planned for this forum to take place last year to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Conference before the pandemic hit all of us. And when the pandemic hit and all the countries were undergoing lockdowns, we really asked, asked ourselves, is there still a place for a Generation Equality Forum? Should we hold an international uh, you know, multi-stakeholder meeting in the midst of a pandemic. And I think it struck us very early on that there is even more relevance to such an international conference taking place that we had to postpone by one year because it has aggravated really extremely gender inequalities. And so in the past year, after the pandemic and after the postponement, we have been trying to be on all fronts to make sure that this forum is an answer not only to the uh, grave gender inequalities we have seen over the past 25 years since Beijing, but even more in a sort of an updated answer or response to the COVID pandemic. And there's a number of initiatives that we have launched that are really a, a direct answer to the pandemic. And one of them is one that we're very happy to carry together with Women in Global Health and the World Health Organization uh, and together with the government of France is specifically to ask for commitments from member states and international organizations to improve working conditions of uh, female workers in the care, health and care workforce. Uh, and I'm very happy that this was really in response directly to the COVID-19 pandemic. We've also engaged uh, and reached out to a member states saying, this is the time you don't want to miss the Generation Equality Forum. We don't know whether it's going to take place again in two, five, 25 years. This is the only time since 1995 that the international community has gathered to speak and debate, but much more than that, to actually make commitments for gender equality. So please look out for substantial commitments that will be made by member states, international organizations, but also the private sector and foundations during the opening ceremony and during the three days of the Generation Equality Forum to really make up for the, the lost time of the last 25 years, but especially uh, the last year. And just a final touch, we're also really engaging the governments, as you were saying, to make sure that they include a gender angle in their uh, rescue plans or uh, you know, uh, assistance package, either nationally or internationally. And really, this is, has been fully integrated into our action coalitions and the announcements that will be made at the forum. That's, that's really exciting, uh, Delphine. And you know, for those um, that haven't made commitments, the deadline has uh, shifted to the 22nd, so there is still time. Uh, but for those that are still considering, you know, why why does this matter? Why are why is it crucial to address these issues when it comes to caring for women, to having more gender equal workplaces and workforce? Um, how does this benefit society at large? What do you, what are you saying to convince them, uh, Delphine? As as you've been part of these discussions um, for over a year now. 
Mm -hmm. Well, there are two arguments. There is the uh, social justice argument and then there's the economic performance argument. And I think two of them are very, are complementing each other. First, equality is, you know, is just a fundamental right. It's, we're talking here about half of the humanity. And we like to say that the Generation Equality Forum is not a forum for women by women. We happen to have a vast majority of women involved in it, uh, but we're gonna have also men. And, and thanks to organizations like Promundo, uh, we make sure that we have a male you know, allyship and, and uh, involvement in the forum. Uh, but this is a question of just social justice. Uh, you know, Equality in, is, is a fundamental right that has been recognized by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights more than 70 years ago. But the second argument is that we do know that societies that have a more equal um, uh, framework and system do perform better on all issues, on all aspects, not only economically, and that's for sure, that's also true of, of private companies, but also in terms of the general well-being of the population, in terms of the human development index, in terms of access to health, access to education. If you give education to girls, if you give access to health and sexual and reproductive rights to girls, you're going to improve all of your different uh, rankings and, and factors and parameters uh, across the board. So that's uh, an extra argument. And I think I'm really realizing that more and more uh, governments across the world, including the global south, are coming to that realization that this is not just a, um, an equality issue, and that's very important. This is also uh, an issue uh, for them to do better for their own population. Thank, thank you, Delphine. I think this is a, a great uh, moment to turn to NIMCO. You know, there is, uh, you know, the, the, the issues that are affecting the global south, but also, you know, a lot of what you talk about is um, already the talent that's there, um, the agents of change that are already doing this important work. From your perspective, what are the most important steps that we need to take to build back equal after this pandemic and really, um, you know, harness and support um, the talented women that are ready agents of change in their society? And, and it'd be great to hear, you know, some stories and examples of this change happening. Yeah, thank you very much for coming back to me. There's incredible talent on the continent of Africa. And I think we also have to take to take a moment and check our privilege because the whole point is there are women and girls on this planet that are fighting for basic human rights in, in, in countries where the rule of law is not even respected. So I do believe in the fact that we need to be able to pay care workers, but we're not going to be able to actually get a, va a real value for women's care and women's work when five-year-old girls are being subjected to FGM in, in order to be sold for cattle. So we have to, as the people with power and the people with 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 privilege really understand that it is not about talking about the care economy it's, it's about really getting the foundations of humanity right and then building on that and then ensuring the fact that we can ensure that all women have access to contraception all women have access to employment and all women have access to the equality to be able to vote for the people that actually um that that that, that care about them so for example um jaha dokure who's an incredible gambian american woman in 2014 with twenty thousand dollars dollars banned FGM in, um, in, 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 in Gambia with, with less than $100,000 in 2019, actually got a fatwa passed against early forced marriage and child marriage. So the real work is being done by African women and it's being done by pennies. So while we talk about the underpayment of women in this side of the world and globally, women that are actually leading forces that are changing the, the lives of women and girls in their own communities are not being paid at all so i think we have to check ourselves for a moment is pledges are great but unless money is put in the hands of women and girls that are actually doing the work especially black and indigenous and african women then i'm not really sure that we're going to be able to achieve anything and one thing that covid has taught us is the fact that we have not had any global um conference but nothing has changed so as as as, as great as that, that gathering the, the good on the great it is in paris or london or wherever However, things are not going to change unless we actually change the funding streams. And I really want to make a, um, a plea to that is the fact that 70 million girls are going to be subjected to FGM between now and 2030 unless we do something. Um, millions of girls are going to be millions of girls and boys are going to be born to the continent of Africa to girls who have been forcibly married that are living in polygamous marriages that are being forced to, to marry all the men. So we can be here and talk about the care economy and uh, 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 everything else, but nothing is going to change unless we deal with the most vulnerable people on our planet, which are African and indigenous women. Thank you, Nimco, for grounding us and checking the privilege and reminding us that the foundation to all of this is 
a strong human rights foundation, which girls have not had the opportunity to realize. Societies have not realized it for girls and women, and a lot needs to be done on that. Um, and especially, I think, in the Build Back um, Equal, build, Building Back Better, you've made it quite clear that we need to look at financial flows and making sure that uh, funding is getting into the hands of girls and women at the community level, especially um, on the African continent, but also thinking about uh, women from indigenous and and other underrepresented backgrounds in, in power and privilege. So I think you very clear call to action. We must take these conversations uh, beyond where they are happening so there can be real change. Um, I'd like to turn to Gary next, you know, asking you very much a similar question. You know, what are the important steps we need to take to build back equal after this pandemic? You know, what is your, um, you know, call to action? One would be national care plans. Um, I think we, we've looked at Uruguay as one example in a case study that we provide in the report that I mentioned earlier. Countries that put resources toward, put the laws in place to say, we them through the care of our elderly, both in paid systems and in the home, I think is one. Two, I think we need clear, I hope my internet is still stable. We need a clear shift in, a, in an ethic of of masculinity. We need to promote healthy, equitable, caring masculinity from early childhood onward. And I think the promise of Generation Equality Forum is that how do we engage boys early on in promoting what caring, equitable man, the TV shows that our children are exposed to, children seeing their fathers involved in the home in caring ways. Third, we need men to be um, allies in ending violence once and for all against women of all kinds, whether it's FGM that NIMCO has been talking about and others. Uh, we know that about one quarter to a third of men in the world will or have used violence against a female partner. That means about two thirds have it. We don't do nearly enough with the two thirds of men who haven't used violence to say, here's what we need you to do to break cycles of violence. And fourth, we need political support. We need men to be allies for women's leadership and men to live up to feminist leadership when we're in power. It's quite clear to us the countries in the world that have fared the worst during COVID have had horrible, typically autocratic, often male-dominated leadership. I can name Brazil, <laughs> India, the U.S. under the previous administration, but where we've had caring economies and caring politicians and care-centered, we've done better in COVID. So leadership, ending violence, care policies, and investing in the younger generation for healthy masculinities. Thank you, thank you, Gary. And I um, just should also put a shout out that uh, to learn more about this agenda, you can check out the State of the World's Father report um, and we'll make sure those resources are shared. And um, that agenda is quite clear and it's, um, it's refreshing to see that there is a call to action for men and transforming gender norms in a way that would benefit all genders. Um, so I'd like to come back to you, Adelphine, you've already given us a preview of what the role of governments are. Um, what are the most important steps um, from the perspective of government of France to build back equal after this pandemic? And what role? Oh, okay, she's been disconnected. Okay, so we will be um, coming back uh, to, to Delphine there. Um, so, you know, just um, uh, uh, turning it back, you know, as we are coming to the Generation Equality Forum, um, Nimco, you alluded to this, that, you know, how do we really make sure that global conversations have local action? Um, what, you know, what, what will we need to do to bring impact to the local level? You know what, I, I sound like a broken record, but it's about deconstructing the way that we fund. And it's actually really taking away from the massive bilaterals and really giving it the direct. And as Dolphine said, the fact that it is that the global South is seeing that the fact that 50% of its economic power in women, it's been under-resourced. I do actually say that Africa's most under-resourced natural, um, under-tapped natural resource is women. So the, the whole point is poverty doesn't just happen. You have to create the foundation for poverty, FGM, early forced marriage, girls out of school, polygamy, those, those those all create conditions for um, early forced marriage and um, for, for 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 poverty and it's about addressing that and we had the g7 here in the uk last week and ultimately one of the, one of the key things that the prime minister said was 
um, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom was said was the fact that we, we need to build back better in a feminist way. And I completely agree with that. The Canadians went out to go for um, a feminist foreign policy. Macron was great on actually saying that in order to be able to sustain Africa, women have to be at the heart of it. So I know that the G7 leaders understand it, but it is about those in philanthropy and those in international de de development also now standing with world leaders and saying that we can trust Black and, um, and First Nation women with money. And I think that's the key thing that we have to do. I fundamentally am bored of the fact that people keep saying that it's it's really hard to fund indigenous women and, 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 and hard to fund black women, but you've never done it. So if you really do want to build back better and you really want to be able to achieve the sustainable development goals and you want equality to be a reality, put money in the hands of black and indigenous women. And it's as simple as that. Uh, and, and Nimka, we, we no longer want you to be a broken record on this. So, you know, the call to action is to really change the systems, get power and financial pl uh, financial flows into the hands of those women and also challenge our norms. Uh, I'm just going to check if Delphine is back with us. Delphine, um, are you there? Okay, no worries. Okay. Uh, Gary, uh, you know, same question to you here. You know, we have a very strong seven point, um, you know, call to action that you've launched, but how does this um, actually get in, uh, into communities and where, you know, how can we really see um, the change and, and any example that you would like to share on, on this front? Sure. I mean, you know, some we do need the macro political and economic changes that I think we've discussed, and those are certainly part of many of the platforms at GF, but there's also things that we can change at the levels of ministries. Um, education sectors that build in um, gender transformative education after school curricula, building it into the school curricula of promoting boys involvement in care and consent and respect for, for girls in the classroom. We also can build this into health sectors. Ministries of Health have done fantastic work around maternal and child health. We've got very creative ways we've, that we've done in Brazil and some other countries, Rwanda, of engaging men as partners in maternal health and birth in after the birth of a child. We've got programming we can do around social protection programming that's already there. The funds have often been allocated, doing some nudges to get men to do a greater share of care work and be supportive of women in the workplace. So some of it's the macro, but there's also a lot of detail in how we design some of the well um, reasonably well-funded program, certainly not enough, and I fully agree with NIMCO about how we shift where the funding goes, but where we've got some good functioning social protection and health services, they can be tweaked and shifted so that we, we oblige men, we obligate men to be part of care, um, whether it's paid or unpaid. Thank you, Gary, for that, that example. And um, and you've also, you know, spotlighted how in Uruguay this has been possible. And you've mentioned a few other countries um, and encourage everyone to check out that work because change is really possible. So as we come uh, to close, unfortunately, Delphine um, is not able to join us for the closing part. But, you know, I know she would say this, you know, engage in the Generation Equality Forum. It is an opportunity for all stakeholders to make commitments. The deadline is the 22nd. Use this as a milestone moment because we don't know when we're going to get this moment again. It's taken 26 years to put this particular um, form back on the agenda, but it only matters if we truly address the root issues. Nimco, you've highlighted we need to keep the human rights framework in mind. We need to get women and girls, their rights realized um, at the most foundational levels. And that also includes making sure that women um, from uh, underrepresented backgrounds, especially uh, women from African descent and indigenous descent are um, getting the resources for change. Gary, you touched upon the very uh, critical role of uh, making sure this is seen um, as a male agenda and uh, not giving as many optional asks to men, um, but really saying men must do this and creating uh, legislative change, policy change, and transforming gender norms at a very early age. Uh, and so on that note, you know, I really want to thank all of our speakers for these inspiring insights as we go towards equality. Let's keep all of this uh, in mind. It should have not taken a pandemic to focus the world's attention on health and the deep inequalities within and between countries. It is time to rethink what we value. Uh, we must value women, girls, 
um, especially women health and care workers have been applauded in this pandemic in every society, but have not been rewarded with safe and decent equal work. Um, it, it is the year of the health and care workers. And uh, as I represent women in global health, I wanna remind everyone, you know, there is an opportunity to make a commitment to the gender equal health and care workforce initiative to drive change on leadership, pay, safety, and decent work for women and healthcare workers. But everyone on today's conversation has shared an opportunity, an agenda to really advance equality. So I ask all of you to join um, each one of us and all the different opportunities that Generation Equality Forum is providing. And let's have a new social contract that is based on greater values of equity and human rights. And to answer this question, who cares for women? Well, we do, we care for women and that's so that women can care for us. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rupa. I don't know if I'm on air. I am, am I? I am, yes I am. Thank you Rupa for um, having uh, <clears throat> moderated this uh, this very inspirational uh, roundtable. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Nimco. Thank you, uh, Dolphine. Um, just uh, once again, the dates for this uh, Generation Equality Forum is from the June the 30th to July the 2nd. And please go on the comment and you have, you'll have all the information to uh, be able to, um, to get to, to this forum. And as um, Fuzile was saying for uh, starting, uh, especially speaking about this forum, um, uh, let's stop talking and uh, let's go to action. So um, we, have, we are running a little bit late with, uh, with our, um, with our um, evening, uh, with our afternoon, sorry, but there are two uh, video coming, very, very concrete example. And uh, Nimco, you'll be happy. There is one video uh, in Africa from uh, uh, Yvonne Prempe Ferguson. Maybe you know her, is a technical specialist at Mozart Mother in Ghana. And there is an another video, very short video of um, Gada Antem Ganza. She is a founder of La Maison des Femmes in Saint Denis in France, near Paris. So, if uh, you are very nice to stay with us for a couple of more minutes before we are ending in a few minutes. Thank you. Hello, I'm Yvonne Ferguson, Technical Specialist and Ghana Country Lead for Mothers to Mothers, an African not-for-profit that employs women living with HIV as frontline health workers called Mentor Mothers. Our Mentor Mother model employs women living with HIV to deliver health services, education, and support to other women at health centers and in communities. For nearly two decades, M2M has witnessed the power of women. We have grown from one site in Cape Town, South Africa in 2001 to span 10 countries across Africa. We currently employ around 1,800 women living with HIV as frontline workers and reach over 1 million people with health services and education each year. We have reached 12 million women and children under two and created 11,000 jobs along the way. We've also achieved what UNAIDS calls virtual elimination of mother to child transmission of HIV among our enrolled clients for six years in a row. We have seen that when we invest in women, they in turn invest in themselves and their families to build a better future. Employment creates important economic empowerment opportunities for mental mothers, helping to address gender inequalities that can make African women vulnerable to HIV and other health issues. And I believe it is the future of healthcare. Services that are designed and delivered by women in the community they aim to serve, supported by technology and with an eye on broader impacts like gender equality and economic opportunity. We will continue to grow our program through innovation and research-based solutions so that we make achieving the global sustainable development goals and universal health coverage a reality.
My name is Radha Atem. I'm a doctor and I created the first multidisciplinary health care center dedicated to women victims of any type of violence, the Maison des Femmes de Saint-Denis. We welcome women of all ages who have been affected by violence and we propose a large range of services all in one place in a safe and confidential environment. The Maison des Femmes objective is to simplify the journey of the victims. Our structure brings together more than 60 professionals, such as doctors, midwives, psychologists, lawyers, to offer victims an adapted treatment path and guarantee open access to services for patients in precarious situations. Take care of migrant women as well, both in their access to care and rights. In a word, we help women get the most basic care, abortions, legal protection, and we also help them build back up, return to school, find employment and stability. On the other hand, we work on violence prevention by giving sexual education course for middle and high schools and offer professional trainings in caring for victims of violence. Our aim is to duplicate the model on a national level in order to help women all over France, but also through Europe. Well, I'm afraid uh, this is the end. Um, I hope you had a very good time with us. Uh, of course, we are all frustrated because we'd like to have all these roundtables lasting far more uh, time that uh, we had. But, um, you know, we all have a, a life, so we have to do things and be very active for, uh, for the, the parity and the gender equality. So uh, thank you again. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you to our moderators. You've been great. And uh, thank you for, to you all, the audience, to, uh, coming from everywhere uh, over the globe. Um, I pass the, <clears throat> the, um, the floor to Anissa, and uh, I want to thank you all the Spark News and the technical guys who are behind all this beautiful uh, machine going on. Uh, once again, thank you, and uh, we'll get there. Yeah, thank you, Bruno, and thank you so much for our technical team for such a wonderful job. Uh, we'd also like to thank our communication partners who took the part in the Towards Equality campaign and truly helped get the word out about this event today. So together we go farther, and so we sincerely thank you for your collaboration to amplify your efforts. So thank you to UN Women, UNESCO, the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Focus 2030, Women Deliver, Asa Moon, Arte, Equality Now, Care International, Promundo, Greenpeace, the World Bank Women Business uh, and the Law, Madame Figaro, Yann Artus Bertrand, Women Make Sense, One France, Equal Measures, Family Planning, Shift Balance, Blue Ventures, the Movement Up and Power Her and Kuto Movement. I'm sure I am missing some of them and I'm very sorry, but thank you so much to everyone. Um, also a specific thank you to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for supporting this program and giving us the capacity to spread constructive narrative for a more inclusive world. So today, as I mentioned, marks the start of the Towards Equality Media campaign. So stay tuned for articles featuring some of the most successful initiatives and opinion leaders pushing for gender equality and the society at large. So if you are in Japan, check out Azali Shimbun in Italy, Corriere de la Sera, in France, the Madame Figaro, in Afghanistan, HD Soup, in Brazil, Foya de Sao Paulo, in the UK, The Independent, in Spain and Argentina, El Diario, in France and Germany, Arte, Switzerland, SRF and at Tribune de Genève, Morocco with Les du Maroc, The Nation in Kenya, and Lorient Le Jour in Lebanon. To access all the Towards Equality articles written by the International Media Coalition, you can visit the link that is in the event description that you are looking at right now. Uh, we all have a part to play in creating the profound change in culture that we all need to reach gender equality and build more inclusive and sustainable societies. So together, we can be part of the Generation Equality Forum and make sure that this happens in our lifetime. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you all. Thank you.